You're listening to episode 106 of the SBP podcast, Mobile Filmmaking, and I'm your host, Susie Botello. I'm going to I'm going to talk about Windows, but I'm not talking about those Windows on PCs. No, I'm going to talk about the Windows of opportunity. There's two of them. There's a window of opportunity to submit your feature length film into the International Mobile Film Festival. And that is before the regular deadline of October 19th. The other window of opportunity is for the short film competition. Get your films in before November 19th. That's the regular deadline for that. So make sure that you get those films in. Submit your films to the International Mobile Film Festival in San Diego. We're planning an in-person event. We're also planning an online event after the film festival so we can share the in-person event. (laughs) Anyways, um, make sure you get your films in, internationalmobilefilmfestival.com. You're going to meet someone in this episode of the SBP podcast. His name is Darcy Yule. He made a feature length film. It's called One Punch. The film has a great cast of characters. And you know what? I'm not going to describe the film because this is going to be redundant. He's going to describe the film, but he's going to do more. He's going to go into lighting, cinematography, uh, pre-production, post-production, and everything you need to know um, about making a feature film with your iPhone. But here, this is the cool thing. This is like a full, informative, substantial episode. And you're going to walk out of this, if, if you're even thinking about making a mobile film and still have doubts, listen to what Darcy has to say. Because I think that he's going to inspire you. Let's go. Hey, I'm here with Darcy Yule. Uh, actually, I wish I was where he was because in San Diego, it's pretty hot right now in the summer. At the end of the summer, we're in August, but uh, over where Darcy is, tell me what the weather is like out there. I'm um, looking out a window and it's very gloomy and people are wearing lots of, uh, lots of clothes and jackets because it's winter in Melbourne. Oh my God, I love it. Mm. <laughs> uh, hey, Darcy. Thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's um, a pleasure. Yeah. I want to share with our listeners why you're on the show. You actually submitted a film to the International Mobile Film Festival here in San Diego. Uh, we haven't made our final selections for the feature films, but whether Darcy's film makes it or not, it's an exciting awesome film and so I asked Darcy to come on the show and share this really inspirational film uh, from the end of first the story the acting and the other thing is uh, well let me see oh my god you guys this film looks like something you're watching on Netflix it's beautifully produced Darcy before I get started I read something uh, that you put at the bottom of your email when we were communicating. Mm -hmm. I want you to explain that because I think that's really important and I'd love for you to share that before we even talk about your film. Sure, yeah. So in Australia, you know, we were colonized by the the English much the same as the Americans um, as you are. But um, one of the movements that's happened in the last maybe – we had a, a bit of a moment almost when you had a moment over there with Barack Obama, we had a, a prime minister called Kevin Rudd who who instituted a day called Sorry Day, which was to say sorry for all the things that we'd done to, horrible things that we'd done as a nation to our Indigenous peoples. And 
one of the upshots of that I think now is is that we're starting to use more um, local names for places. So, you know, places that used to be called Ayers Rock are now called Uluru. They're given their Indigenous name. And when we write emails now, it's kind of um, we tend to put on the end of it, you know, so I write, I respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and future who are traditional owners of the land on which I'm located. And that's really important because it just signifies to everybody that we realise and we respect where we're living because the Indigenous Australians had such a great respect for the land and and where they lived and for each other. And um, it's a beautiful thing, first of all, for me to be able to incorporate into my life, but I think it just implies respect as well, which has been missing for such a long time. You know, that's really interesting. Um, So far away, halfway across, um, well, full circle almost across the world, um, where you are, Uh, Mm. the Native Americans here, uh, some of the ones that I've met, um, they have this thing where, you know, they they select certain herbs, right, Uh, and use them for medicinal service um, uh, purposes, right? Mm. But before they they grab that herb from the earth, they actually ask for permission. Mm. And it's a sign of respect. And they ask, you know, for permission to to take that from the earth and and use it. And Mm. I think, you know, it's such a it's such an interesting, you know, definitely something that that more people, I believe, personally should pay attention to because it's not a coincidence, you Mm. know, that that they're listening to something out there uh, from one end of the world as people here are listening to something. It's about, you know, the, the opening of that part of people deep inside and they're receiving the same messages. Yeah, it's very heart-led, which I think is important. Yes, definitely. And it's very, very awesome, I think, of you to, you know, to to do that especially making a film because it's a very um i know in new zealand uh they've had some issues with things like that as well Mm. so new zealand is probably influenced us quite a lot in the way that they because they're much more forward thinking i think in the way that they relate to their indigenous um peoples so we're a bit behind but i think we've learned a lot from them yeah most definitely all right, guys. Let's let's talk about what you're what you're really anticipating here. <laughs> let's talk about your film. Sure. It's called uh, One Punch. Yep. Uh, why don't you explain a little bit about? Well, I mean, they're they're not watching the film yet, right? Someone down the line will watch the film and understand more about why you chose that that title. But mm. without giving away the film, mm. um, publicly. <laughs> um, explain the the synopsis of the film and why you called it One Punch. Sure. Um, pretty often in Australia, and this is pre-pandemic, but also around the world, I think um, there's a history of young men going out for a night on the town, or not even particularly young men, and then probably drinking too much and somehow these evenings sometimes end up in some form of tragic violence. So uh, I've had it happen to myself, um, walking down the street with a friend when I was 21, he got hit in the back of the head for no apparent reason, whole fight started, but these things happen quite a lot. And it sort of felt to me like, um, it was still happening, you know, 20 years later after it happened to me, these things were still happening. And in fact, people were starting to die. Um, and so that started the genesis of of making a story about a young man who might go through this experience. But one of the things I think interested me the most was where this um, reaction came from, where young men felt it was okay to be violent with one another. And Mm -hmm. um, I did a bit of research, I did a lot of research actually, and I noticed that in the US they called it a one-punch incident. in Australia, we called it a um, king hit initially, but we've now rebadged it as a coward punch. 
Um, but it also happened in other parts of the world as well. So I, this is where I thought, okay, there's a story here. And so the, the story of One Punch is, follows a young man named Matt who's an Italian-Australian boy and he's just on the cusp of finishing high school and he's about to go out into the world as an adult and he's not doing very well at school uh, and he's getting a lot of pressure from his parents. And as a result of this, um, as well as the way that he's treated by his family and his peers, uh, you know, he's going to head down a maybe a, a difficult path when he goes out for his 18th birthday. I hope I explained that properly. It's, yeah, my yeah. first interview. Yeah. I did, it, well, okay, so this film, uh, the characters in the story, the protagonists of the story, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, so Matt is the protagonist of One Punch. He's, I, th- I thought it was really interesting to look at a, kid who um had probably everything going for him from the outside when you look at someone and you go you know they've got a they've got a seemingly nice family they've got good friends they're not in poverty you know this is the kind of middle class australian kid who should be doing you know fairly well but you never know what's happening behind doors and so uh part of that is that his family are involved in you know a, a number of businesses um and he's struggling at this age where he's trying to become a man and understand what a man is. He's trying to meet girls. He's trying to go out with friends. He's trying to do all these things. But also he's trying to come to terms with, with who his family is and how they sit in the society that he's involved in. And it's it's a very difficult time. I remember particularly for me being 18, you, you're often quite stuck between – this whole life of school that you've had for most of your life and then all of a sudden you're, you know, you're booted out into the world and, and told, okay, now you've got to go and be successful. And so in that very small moment, that's where I wanted to situate the character and kind of put them under the pressure, I guess, of that kind of environment. All right, Darcy. Now, everyone, everyone who's, who's seen this, all few people, <laughs> that have watched this film. I think you're like um, the second. <laughs> yeah. Um it's 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 unbelievable because for me um looking at it, uh, watching it, you know, first of all aesthetically it looks very well done. Uh the production value is there also with all the locations that you used mm. um in in the first few scenes, right? uh in in the car in the daylight um yeah. it just opens up like just any other hollywood film that i've that i've watched uh the camera placements and the cinematography is incredible um i was talking to um james smith and caroline spence in uh one of our episodes and i was talking to them about establishing shots mm. You know, in especially in feature films, which I think they belong in all films, but I think mm. they they definitely belong in in longer stories, right? And you do that very well. You have some great establishing shots, you know, that that you expect to see in films that are sometimes overlooked. Mm. Um, and yeah, I I think the cinematography is is incredible. And it's not all cinematography that you can only do with the phone. There were some scenes uh, in the bathroom uh, and things like that that I mm. thought probably were you benefited from a lot from using using the the, the iPhone. Yeah, for absolutely. those shots, right? Um, explain before I, I feel like I'm teasing everybody, but explain <laughs> to you know. Let's talk a little bit about you and your history so they understand where you even came up to those skills uh, that you have as a director sure, and yeah. um, and a filmmaker. Uh, um, who is Darcy and where did he come from and what brought you into this whole world of filmmaking and then iPhone filmmaking? Sure. Well, you know, like anyone, I think there's a lot of luck involved. Um, I, I was studying two different I was studying Italian and Spanish of all things at university and um, I got a job working in a restaurant or in a cafe um, cleaning dishes 
And it turned out that the people that owned that cafe ran a film company, uh, quite a high-level commercial film company in Brisbane in Queensland and they made a lot of um, international hair commercials and soap commercials and things like that. And because we had a, we've got beautiful locations in Queensland, um, you know, we used to do a lot of international shoots and so I got to be, I guess I started as a catering assistant on large commercials and mm-hmm. from there I saw, like I remember being on my first commercial which was a big Sunsilk commercial with Laura Dern and um, I'm sitting there looking at 30 people standing around in their shorts and T-shirts going, I think this is for me. I, I really want to do this because I'll never have to wear a tie or any of those kinds of things. So, and it's really interesting that from that first shoot, um, at the end of that first shoot, two other young guys on that shoot, we went and shot a short film and it was meant to be a one night short film. And we, you know, I was going to be, I don't know, camera assistant. And by the end of five nights, we were still shooting. I'd become one of the lead actors. I'd also was first ADing and lighting and all these things. So we just kind of, you know, got really stuck into it. And those three, the three of us have actually gone on to have quite, you know, decent careers in different areas. Um, so you kind of built this, you know, this sense of family. I really attached to that. And also I, I got really attracted to the camera department um, because the company that I was working for, the, the director, he also shot his own commercials. So he was a, a DOP and a director. And um, so I used to go into the film company and I would go in and, you know, sweep the floors, do whatever for free. I would go and clean equipment and make myself, you know, useful around the place and that got me more and more work. Uh, and then I started like just loading films. So back in the days of loading films, so I started loading film on short films and, you know, for free obviously, like I did, a, you know, years of, of free work. I changed my degree to do a, a screen production degree which was basically video, so which working with Hi8 and yeah really really dived in and I was lucky enough to get some work on a studio um, feature which was a, a film called Pitch Black which um, was one of the first Vin Diesel films and so I got a job yeah, on that. Yeah I a saw that as soon as runner. you said it I was like cool. Yeah yeah it was great it was a great experience he's a he's a lovely man uh, or yeah. was back then I don't know what's happened since but yeah um, it was a really good experience to work on a large feature like that. And then the last two weeks of that feature, I got to work in the camera department as a video split operator. And that sort of helped me bump up the, up the, what we sometimes call the greasy pole here. Um, mm-hmm. So then, yeah, after that, I was able to start, I started loading and then focus pulling on TV series and stuff like that, that was made for so I worked on this tv show called The Lost World it's really schlocky and kitsch um but it was made for Canadian tv and just doing you know doing what all people do which is you know working with friends making music videos shooting music videos less uh, I actually wasn't shooting much in those days I was started directing and I found this passion for directing because I started working with actors and discovered wow there's this whole process that they go through um and you know, just being lucky enough to work with some young actors who really committed to their roles and did a lot of research and did a lot of homework, that kind of inspired me. And so I made a couple of films, um, won, won a couple of awards as a young filmmaker and then I thought I'll go and do my master's. So I went to a school, I applied to a school called the AFTRS, which is in Sydney, which is a bit like the AIF, I guess, but the Australian version. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I was really lucky to get into that. But I was pr- – it, it's funny in hindsight, I you know, I applied for the directing course and got in. Um, and that Well, I think you were doing something here that I want to point out that it seems like from what I'm listening to that you were, you were working it. Like you started working for free, right? Yeah. Yeah. To to network and meet people. And, then, and at the same time, you were building your reputation. Yeah. And your integrity, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, Susie, I still work for free because I, a, I love <laughs> working on films. I mean, I really love that process. And sometimes I love just being a camera assistant still. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's also how things get made. Like things, you know, it's very hard to make productions 
uh, if you don't have a budget. And I mean, that's I can talk to that a bit more about how we made one punch, but definitely, yeah. um, you know, you've got to. I I sort of feel you've got to give favors to get favors, and so those um, those kinds of experiences were really important too because you learn so much. Like it, the difficulty I think with film schools is, you know, I did my masters for two years. I made four films in two years, um, but as a as a camera assistant, I could have worked on thirty films, in, you know, or thirty little productions in two years. So the the benefit of learning is really different from being on you know being on decent sets. You really really pick up a lot, but by the same token, it's very hard to pick up those heads of department kind of skills that you you know are hard to learn from a book as well. You've really got to practice. I had the benefit of. Um Finding, uh, finding the work, and then deciding to to change my major mm. into film and video. And so while I was learning, I was actually doing it, mm. and that helped develop, you know, whatever it developed inside me. Yeah. Um, where other most other students um, were studying, and then, you know, I mean, they were always looking for ways to get their foot in the door, but they were busy studying it, yeah. you know, and, and things are handed to you. You know, you go to the lab and there's the, uh, the editing equipment and you go to, you know, rent out and check out the camera. You know, you don't have, even though it's hard, you don't have the hardships that you do out on the field. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I think there's, there's still an interesting, um, cause I, I, I teach as well. There's still an interesting balance, I think, between, um, theoretical learning and, and practical learning in, in film education. I don't know if we've cracked it yet, but I think I actually think smartphone filmmaking has great potential um, mm-hmm. for managing that. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to talk about that a little bit. I'm oh, my actually, God, go yeah. go for it. Just start talking about that. You got well, me all excited here. Well, because <laughs> I'm actually – I started my doctorate at the start of this year um, and what got me – it got me excited because of doing one punch and, and – I really found that, you know, I invested three years of my life and, and you know, a certain amount of money um, to make this film. And there were times when I was so down about it. But also, you know, when I looked back, I just, you know, when I, when I entered into the, you know, I had this ethos when I entered into the making of the film, which was I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to get caught up on what things could be or what they should be. I'm just going to keep moving forward. And when I come to a decision... I'm just going to take that next step and, and, you know, move into it rather than stop. And so from that, I was able to make the film and learn so many amazing lessons like that, that thing you were saying about uh, establishing shots. You know, the, fir- the first scene of the film is my character waking up in bed, which I think is the cheesiest shot of any, you know, it's, it's a very traditional filmmaking technique. Um, yep. And I did not even realize I was doing it. What was the, it? Back to the Future that started out the same way. Yeah, although you know, it, it, <laughs> it it's weird that I didn't even pick up on it um, because to me the reason I wanted to do it was I wanted to start the film with a, a perspective of my character and end it with a perspective of him, so that we're looking at him as an audience. And I wanted to be a little bit distant from him at the start, and I wanted to be right in there with him at the end. Um, and from there it kind of you know that's where it came from so i guess it you know as long as it comes from a, a position of you're trying to do something then it works but it is an old mm-hmm. technique um but it works that's why it's used yeah, yeah that's true yeah I, I at least i didn't have an alarm clock um but <laughs> uh yeah it, you know what yeah i gotta tell you something it's it's pure irony uh one of the first films that i ever worked on actual narrative films mm. started out the same way the mm. alarm clock you know goes out this guy's hand is like oh and he's waking <laughs> up and it's a teenager so it's yeah. funny <laughs> oh hey we've we've all made those and and <laughs> there there's a real truth about them and i think actually everyone needs to make one of those films to because it's a natural bookend to a story it's the beginning of the day and and things start off this way um mm-hmm. so yeah i think it's i i just think it's um it's interesting that with being able to use a smartphone, you know, we're able to shoot this film in, we shot for, it would have been 13 days, you know, 12, it was a 10 day schedule that, you know, we had to do three days of pickups, but that was it. Um, and, 
you know, to shoot a feature in that amount of time is is quite a big feat. And yeah. there's no way we could have done that with all these because actually we have all these different locations and we have cars and all those kinds of things and we're able to do it because of the smartphones and and I think also because, you know, I was, I was shooting it. Um, but the one thing that really helped was having a, a camera operator, so someone who was actually operating the camera um, maybe 50%, 60% of the time. Well, you were an AD, so you probably had an excellent uh, shot list too. Yeah, I was was quite organised um, and I think you have to be. I think um, that organisation really helps you. So, the ho- yeah, absolutely, the whole thing was was planned out and but not pre-blocked I think was the key. So, we, you know, I knew every location, I knew how I thought it should be but then we just went back to that idea that at every location let's not get there and stress about where the camera is, let's get there and block it through, work out where everything is, work out where it's happening. Um, and we did a lot of oneers as well. So we did a lot of, you know, single um, setup scenes because that's the benefit of the smartphone as well is that, you you know, the production design that you're talking about, we're in the middle of the city of Melbourne. Um, crowds going around, we're actually there on a Friday night when it's really busy, but no one notices because... I'm just a dude with a smartphone, you know, and the characters are just standing there. There's no, you know, very minimal lighting and um, and that's... Oh, you, you know, did... I got to talk about that. So you did these creative shots in between establishing the scene, the mm, night scene, the club yeah. scene, the street scene, yeah. you know, um, and, I, and I really, really... I just think all of that was was adding texture to to the story and the mm. setting and it helps people step step away and step really fully inside of not just the characters but as as you know where they were and what they were experiencing mm. yeah it's i mean and, and those were all shot pretty much during the shoot because we'd be walking around the city and we'd see you know there's a guy carrying lifting up a girl and carrying her across the street because they're both drunken idiots and um, <laughs> and that's happening, you know, when we filmed it luckily from behind so we don't know who they are but those kinds of things were just actually happening and unfolding in front of us so we're able to capture it in the moment and um, and use it and it's I, th- I think some of that stuff's really amazing. Like, you know, there are homeless people sleeping in the street. It's, it's what's actually there as all these other people are going around and drinking and, you know, having a, a supposedly good time. Um, yeah it's a it's a lot like here downtown in san diego at night Mm. um where you know you walk around in the heat of that night um now probably there two o'clock is like over here at 11 o'clock because they close everything up at you know by two Mm. um we're over there they probably have you know they don't close them so Mm. early but you know the 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 guy sleeping on the sidewalk you know, mm. things like that are very, very common to see here mm. as well. And I did want to, I mean, that, that's in there to make deliberate comment on maybe the values that we have as a society. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then, okay, now here's the other thing. Um, once, I, I just want to share this because I don't get to share this part. Uh, because there's always lighting and things like that that you want to talk about. But when you go inside the nightclub Mm. and you have all these colorful lights that are naturally there, Mm. it it seemed like the phone was handling it, the camera, right, was handling those really well. Yeah, so we – I only had – I had a lighting package of two – like I invested it in a hire of two lights and – Um, because they were battery powered lights. They were these little, um, lights called micro RGB lights. So they were a little, um, this great little, they're they're solid. Like you can, you can, you know, you could probably hit someone over the head and they, they, I'm trying to be polite without being rude, but you know, you could kill someone with them if you hit them, right? They're mass, these solid little things, but they're no bigger than probably a, a, um, a cake box and um, they're absolutely waterproof. Like you can dunk them in water um, and they run off these um, great batteries. And these lights can do all sorts of different effects. They can do flickers, they can do lightning TV, all that stuff. But they also do every single color possible. And um, 
So you can just tune it in at the back and they were – so while we did have some lighting in the nightclub, what we were actually doing was providing most of that light from these two little lights. And you can't see it but quite often our gaffer is actually – in the background of shots, dancing with people and just holding the light above his head and it's just out of frame. <laughs> so you've got these kind of, you know, because he was a, he's a, um, a, a friend of mine, an old friend of mine, and he, um, you know, he was just in it. He was, he was there to enjoy it. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Maybe you can share if you happen to have links. Yep. Um, you know, we can share it with, with our listeners as well. Sure. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. pretty, yeah. yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, share a little more now, uh, going back to the beginning mm. of the set, um, the father and yeah. this other character, the, 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 the love interests father. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the bullying that, that plays out through, through this movie between the kids and the, I mean, that's a big part of the story. Mm. Um, how did you block those? Because there's some punching going around and just that. Yeah, look, I, I was very really lucky to have worked on, you know, I think this show that I worked on back in the late 90s, The Lost World, you know, we did a fight mm-hmm. scene every second day. Um, and even though I was a camera assistant, I was able to see how the stunties blocked it and how they shot it. And because the camera's, you know, it's one eye, it's not 3D, you can work with the parallax error to really make anything work if you put the camera in the right place and you cut at the right time. So, you know, we we just very carefully went through it and then, you know, when he throws his punch, he's he's quite a way away from the other. There's no chance that he's hitting the actor, but you just you block it so that the action of the punch is happening but also the actor being hit is also reacting at the same time um, so that you get a, a believable uh, moment. Um, and, in fact, you know, we we... We did the same with with other sequences in the film as well, where we, you, you know, you you. It's a bit like shooting a music video when a music video has, you know, you might have three hundred shots for a three minute music video. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes for some of the scenes, you know, like for example, there is a, a large fight scene in the film, um, and I knew when we scheduled the film that I just wanted one night to shoot that. I didn't want to have to go to any other locations. I didn't want to have to do anything else. We're just going to focus on this one scene for the whole night. And so in the schedule you can work that around and it meant that we were able to get, you know, probably I think we probably got 80 setups for that scene. Um, mm. And it gives you the ability to really um, make it work in the edit. So, yeah, whereas a lot of the other scenes were about just getting this one shot to tell everything the, with a lot of the violence, you know, I, I wanted it to be really visceral. I wanted people to to feel the impact because I think the sense that um, the lead character matters in this world that is ruled by, you know, casual aggression. You know, his, his father hits him, you know, other people get hit. It's very normal for some people in this story. And, you know, therefore I think that kind of leads to, you know, why things, why these violent events happen. Um and, and that's been my experience anyway as a young man is that, you know, we we react in those ways because we see it or we experience it. So I really wanted the audience to kind of be able to feel it and, yeah. Yeah, there was such a, there's a, there was such a, uh, a connection between the characters also, yeah. you know, uh, within the family characters and, you know, and the people that were involved. Um, and I think you you were you were concentrating because of your experience which is why i'm talking about all of this mm. um you know sharing it with with our listeners because you have this skill set that you had already so you kind of knew what to look out for like you were just talking about right now spending a night on that fight scene yeah and how important it is to make that believable but you can do that all there uh and screw that up to the point to where when you get in post-production, your editor is like, I can't make it work right. Yeah. And you end up with something, you know, kind of flimsy, which even some of the best films I've watched, I'm like, really? Like, what made that decision, you know, 
you picture the editor calling in the director and saying, Hey guy, look, I, mm. you know, or girl, whatever, but you know, this, this is, this is the best I can do, you know, with what you gave me. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, th- I think, um, I guess you do it often enough, enough that it gets drummed into you certain, like, again, I go back to having worked on, you know, what we called fast TV, where we'd shoot about seven minutes a day um, as a camera, like by the end of my period as a camera assistant, my DOP was letting me, you know, he's saying go over there and set that shot up. And so I started to get a, the opportunity to operate every now and then. And you just, you know, you when you're on a, a big set, there is a lot of standing around. So you're talking to people and you take those ideas, I guess, with you because it's, you know, that old, have you heard that old um, term? It's not the time it takes to take the takes. It's the time between the takes that takes the time. Yes. Um, yeah. And like that's, you know, there's so much time preparing for something. Um, and if you know that and if, you're, if you've been able to experience that, then I think you can really focus on how to get from A, you know, shot A to shot B to shot C to shot D. And, and it may seem counterintuitive sometimes to go, hey, let's just stop and let's just look at the whole thing and let's work it out and then we'll light it from this place and then we'll just shoot the whole thing. Because we didn't we didn't model our lighting much. I mean, as much as possible, I just went, okay, I'm going to put the biggest light that I can and that's going to be our key and then we're going to – maybe we'll have a little bit of fill but maybe not and just we're just going to shoot it from every like, every position that yeah. we can. And because you've got an iPhone, you can. You know, you can um, right. jump around and, and just really quickly reposition and just using all of those tricks that you learn from large productions like, um, you know, moving the act around so the light's a little bit better rather than moving the light, you know, and maybe the background's not the correct background, but no one's really going to pick up on it. Um, those kinds of things are, are really useful. Um, but yeah, the, yeah the, there's, there's cheating. There's a lot yeah. of cheating going on, but you, you have to play a balance between cheating and then figuring out sometimes it's worth taking the time yeah. to set up s- certain things as well. And that, mm. that really only comes from experience. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, look, I'm, I'm trying to, my goal here is to inspire people mm. to make movies with their phones. And I'm, and I'm really pushing people who are making many short films to make feature films. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, and there's, there's some people that I talk to, not, not just in the podcast, off the podcast. Mm. Um, and I tell them, look, you're, I've, I've watched enough of your short films. Uh, some of them have participated in the film festival enough times. And I say to them, you're ready for a feature film. Just, mm. you know, trust me. I mean, you trust me with your films already. Yeah. <laughs> you know me well. Trust me when I'm telling you, you're ready to start making a feature film. Uh, I can tell by, you know, how you've progressed with your short films, you know. And I'm not saying, oh, you're wise to take my advice, mm. but it, it's part of what I'm what I'm trying to do here. And you can only get that by, you know, through experience. I mean, I think, you know, the play on words, you know, you can only become an expert or as close to an expert with the experience. Those two start with the same yeah. word, right? Yeah. I look, I, I think I'd been in the industry for about 20 years before and I'd always wanted to make a feature film, you know, and I keep ask, asking myself now why didn't I do it earlier? And, in fact, some of my mentors had said to me, you know, this is where you should be. You shouldn't be because I did – Oh, sorry, commercials and all these other things. But when I finally made the decision, you know, in 20, it was in halfway through 2018, I actually went, okay, I'm going to make a film. And um, I came back and I spoke to my wife and I said, is this okay? Can I, you know, spend this time over the next couple of years to make this film? And I think I'm going to shoot it on smartphones. And I think I'm really inspired by obviously tangerine and you know unsane and and all of that kind of stuff and then i added on top of it i think i I don't know what the story is yet but i'm going to do this crazy process where i work with actors in character-based improvisation and we're going to make it as we go um and luckily she said yeah go for it and and these are experienced actors 
They're well, actually, the kids are all. This is all their mainly their first projects. Um, but definitely the dad, yeah, Mirko, the who plays the father, is a phenomenal man and a, a phenomenal actor. And because of the process that we went through, um, where they were all in, like basically they all created their own characters mm. with with me as a conversation. You know, the the are, are you familiar with the process at all, Susie? The character based improvisation. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, I, cool. I took drama classes oh, in, cool. in yeah. every high school I attended yeah. and um, it, it was my forte because I hated memorizing lines. Yeah, yeah. So they, they um, the way it started was they all brought me 20 or 30 different people that they knew in real life and then I, we would talk through those people and I would go, that's the person. I want you to go and follow that person around and I want you to base a character on them and then we'd change the name and then we'd build a, a history and then we'd, I'd start throwing them into improvisations and, and really basic stuff like go and get a coffee with your dad or, you know, your, um, one, one of my favourite ones was the, the, these two schoolboys and one was selling um, fake essays or selling essays um, to another boy who was buying them, you know, who needed a, an essay because he wasn't very academic and they were doing this deal in a public place but they were both completely useless at doing any kind of, you know, dealings and... Um, I told one of them, you know, don't take less than two hundred and fifty dollars for this essay. And I told the other kid, you only need to give them one hundred and fifty. And so when they came together, they had this natural, you know, conflict. Conflict, yeah. And out of that sprung this, you know, this these reactions that they had, and they had to negotiate how to go forward. And it was really funny because the the kid who did the essay just went, well, here's the first half, but I'm not giving you the second half, and then took the money, and you know it created a, a response to the situation that they were going to be in in the story. So um, that's why I think the performances and the relationships work well is because they, they actually spent a long time in their shoes. Like they did a whole, uh, you know, half-day improvisation at one stage where um, they all came around for dinner at the family house and Mirko, who plays the dad, is actually this phenomenal chef. He was a chef before an actor. And so he's made Oh, I know. I was looking at that going, oh my God, obviously mm. this is not something you just learn on set for, no. for one film. No, when he's making the pasta at the end and stuff, yeah, that's yeah. all. And that all comes from that experience of like once he started doing it in the in the improvisation, everyone gathered around and they were really interested <laughs> and it was fascinating. And then he started teaching people and it's like, oh, this is a scene. So that that scene at the end is um is, you know, I regret the way I shot it, but at the end it had it had an element to it that really worked um, and it, you know, it signifies the, the, the reconnection of the, of the father and the son um, through this, this act. You know, there's no dialogue. There was no dialogue written for that scene. They just did it. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. You know, um, we're, just to satisfy this, tell, share with, with us um, what was the biggest difference in shooting with traditional cameras for you in this film. Um, what do you, what, what, let me see how I can phrase this. Some of the things, some of the scenes that you, we've just discussed, right? Mm. You were shooting them with a smartphone. Yeah. If you had shot them with a traditional camera, what would what would that have cost you as far as the filmmaking process uh, in economic in, terms and and well without the i mean in the uh, conventional like you know well we would have like for example the nightclub mm. scene right mm. that we were just talking about if you hadn't shot that mm. uh with a smartphone if you would have shot it with a traditional camera and we're talking tripods mm. and you know yeah. big lights and everything what how you know, how would that have come together? Would it have, in the end, would it have come together differently? Would we have seen a difference in, in the yeah, way that film ab- was shot? Ab- absolutely, I think, because to, to a certain extent. Um, but I think, the cho- you know, the ability to use a lens is somewhat restrictive with smartphone filmmaking, but it's also quite freeing when you've got, you know, this is just, this is the only lens you can use. Like we used a Moondog uh, anamorphic adapter. The, the Moondog Labs? Yeah, yeah. And then um, I used a, a moment 
close-up lens for the because I was using a camera that only I, I only used the main lens on an iPhone eight for most yeah. of it, so eight plus. And um, so if I wanted a close-up, I actually had to because it's the film sh- shot to be anamorphic, so the close-ups are actually mm-hmm. cropped. Um, but using mm. a, a a tighter lens, and and in fact, those are the sh- some of those shots look amazing. Um, and so I think the the restriction of not having a close up lens it can be is quite difficult for me. Um, but also, what I discovered from previous films that I'd made short films was that I get too enamoured with the close up, and I bring it in way too early. And in fact, sitting back is I think really important. But yeah, look, the the nightclub scenes. We shot that in one night. Um, there's about five scenes in there and um, there's no way I could have done that with, you know, and that's a, like a 10-hour night. That's not a 16-hour night. We didn't go overtime or anything. Um, so there's no way that we could have done that. I think, you know, we would have needed camera assistants and focus pullers and gaffers and lighting and all those kinds of things. Um, and I don't know that the story would be any better. I, I don't think it would be. Um, so I really was, you know, I was, I knew at the time I was enjoying the way, like, you know, I'd, I'd have to take a camera off a tripod and put it on a steady cam or a Ronin or something like that and then you'd have to balance it and then, it, you know, you'd, something would change and you'd have to rebalance it. So that whole process of, um, you know, what I call big filmmaking um, mm-hmm. really gets in the way, I think, of, just telling the story and and like you said you know um i did an assembly edit about two weeks after we finished the shoot and i showed it to a friend and they said oh what did you shoot it on is it you know and i'm like it's a smartphone and they're like nah and in fact people have the funny thing is susie that i've had people go uh look you know it just like it's clear that it's not a it's not an alexa or it's not a you know a panavision but um some people look at the film and go they don't realise it's a smartphone film at all and um, and I think that kind of counts against it a little bit because, it, you know, it's been very – I haven't been able to get into any any festivals apart from smartphone festivals because the, um, you know, the I think the format, it's – I'm struggling and fighting against films with larger budgets and, you know, more expensive equipment. But at the end of the day, I'm so grateful that I shot it on a smartphone because the immediacy, being able to be there and just this sense of, you know – um, you can put that camera anywhere. No one's going to see it. No one notices. You can get this amazing stuff. You know, I was some of the stuff was shot. Actually, there, there were some pickup shot during lockdowns here in Melbourne. Um, you know, there's some time lapse of driving through the streets. I literally just put the camera in the front seat of the car and went for a drive one night. And mm-hmm. you know, it, it's very hard to do that kind of stuff with when you've got to go and hire a camera or you've got to, you know. So having the having this smartphone there that you can just grab a sunset or grab a wide shot or whatever it is, is um, very freeing. And again, the story, it's the story that matters. I'll never forget this one. It was a horror film. It was shot inside this little cabin. Uh, We had spent, it was a one weekend short film. Hmm. And the camera guy, he wanted to use a film camera. Hmm. And um, the whole place, uh, it was shot day for night. Mm. And it was awfully dark. That never went anywhere, that film. Mm. <laughs> it just didn't. I, I remember seeing a DVD and going, I, I'm, I, I'm having to turn off all the lights where I'm watching it and I still can't see anything. Oh, um, wow. It was very bad. And I, you know, I'll never forget. So we're, they were setting up a dolly shot inside this little, you know, this little cabin. They had this big film camera. And mm. the DP drops the lens. Oh, God. <laughs> and broke it. And this wasn't, you know, you were just talking about Moondog Labs, who, by the mm. way, um, we just found out they, they are sponsoring our film festival this year. Oh, that's year. amazing. Congrats. Uh, yeah. So, so a little shout out. Um, so he drops this and it, of, of course, it cracks or whatever happened to it. And I took it upon myself to go get it fixed and mm. get a different, you know, a new glass put in. It took the rest of the day. Mm. I mean, I got back and it was almost midnight. You mm. know, it was just like just such a horrible experience. Now, I just imagine that happening, right, mm. with a smartphone. Big deal. 
big deal. Yeah, just next. Um, you know, I had I, I had to. I remember going to Apple and and buying a, an iPhone eight plus to shoot it on because I just I didn't want to be taking calls at the same time as I'm trying to shoot something. Um, but and telling the person there, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I'm going to make a film with this phone, and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, whatever, you know. And um, it was quite funny, but the reality is, yeah, you could just go and buy this thing, and um, uh, you know, I still got that phone and I still use it to shoot quite a lot because a the Moondog lens only fits that phone but it's it's got a particular beauty about it and those lenses are you know they're really really amazing they really do get a good look um yeah they do that's how tangerine yeah uh was made with that and also the other thing I should have mentioned this too um the other thing is the fact that you're able to watch the footage right after yeah. and say oh you know, that works instead of waiting till you're developing film yeah. <laughs> to find out that all the shots that you shot indoors were too dark. <laughs> well, I I shot a lot of tests and actually while you were talking about that in terms of darkness with, with shooting on film, um, I did a lot of testing and what I discovered was what was more important than, a, than the right exposure of what you wanted to see was that you really had to have your contrast ratio right when you're shooting with these phones. So yes, you need to, you need to have your, your character lit properly, but you need to really make sure that you're preserving your highlights, you know, so that the sky is not going too bright. Um, and even your shadow areas, you need to make sure that they're not too lit. So a lot of the lighting that we really did was going, okay, this is the location we're in. This is what it looks like at this time of day. We're going to come back here and shoot, but we're going to need to add light from here. You know, and I know it sounds simple, but but I think one of the things that often gets missed with smartphones is, you know, they don't light. handle contrast as well as as larger sensors. So if you can take care of that and still get a good exposure, um, it means you can do a lot more with the grade because the, you know, I graded the film pretty heavily. Um, Shot it, shot it in a log mode with Filmic Pro. So, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, but thanks for, for bringing <laughs> that up. I was going to ask yeah. you if you were using an app because um, that's that's the norm, the, the anamorphic lenses and Filmic Pro. Yeah. Um, for feature films, you know, that want to have that cinematic look. And 24p as well, I think, you know, m making sure that you're shooting at 24 frames per second as opposed to 25 does give it that little bit, you know, more of a softer edge. The, the, I was, yeah, the edge. Mm -hmm. um, what about the audio? Uh, so audio, so when I, I had this kind of ethos, like I said, going into the film was going to, I wasn't, I was going to try and spend as little as possible, but there were three areas where I paid for crew. So I had a makeup artist and I had a, gaffer and I had a sound recordist so I had a person who was just recording sound the whole time on their external device so they were recording onto a proper sound um, piece of equipment with radio mics and and all of that so we were slating all the shots and then and then syncing in post and that's been a huge difference because I think probably 80% of the film is the actual dialogue like 80% of the dialogue is actually from the day and there's probably only about, you know, 15, 20% of ADR. Um, and then obviously all the, you know, there's a lot of Foley and stuff like that, but yeah. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you, I mean, imagine going through all that and having, you know, the yeah. sound comes out like the microphone on the iPhone or something. Yes. It's like, yeah. are you kidding me? Well, the, it's incredible. I'm very impressed with your film. Um, I hope it gets selected so that, uh, we're hoping to have an in-person film festival here in San Diego and you'll be able to come and meet everyone and uh, do a presentation. That'd be amazing. Um, you know, uh, maybe if some of your actors want to come out and uh, check out the night scenes in San Diego <laughs> <laughs> um, as well. Um, Darcy, if you had some advice, uh, something that, you know, not the typical, you know, just get out there and do it type thing, <laughs> but, you know, some solid, good, solid advice, especially now that, it, you know, I realize you're also an instructor. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to our listeners regarding making feature films with, with smartphones? Um, I think the, the big thing that 
that came through for me in this situation was making something that was true to you. So what the one thing I didn't mention was, that, you know, the film actually came from this idea because I was playing sport one day and there was a fight on the sporting field and this was a couple of years ago, just bizarre. And I went, what if someone had been hit, you know, they could have been killed and that's where the idea came from. And I think taking things from your life, there, there seems to be a backlash against that these days, whereas back in, you know, sixty in the 60s, you know, the French were like, let's talk about our own expression, you know, the, the American New Wave, of talking about things that were happening to themselves. I think as filmmakers we should really be looking at our own experiences. It's not introspective and it's not navel-gazing. I think it's like we've all got something to say and we all have these unique experiences and, in fact, the only thing that's going to make you stand out is if you tell a story about your existence as opposed to trying to tell the next Tarantino film or the next, you know, you're not going to be able to do, um, you know, the Edgar Wright kind of thing maybe yet because you just don't have the funds. But you can talk about things that matter to you and I think that's really important is is that authenticity because at the end of the day, you know, with, with One Punch, you know, I, I watch the film and I see the faults in it but I'm so happy that I expressed myself um and that i said this thing i wanted to say and even if people say you know i don't like the ending or why'd you do this to me it doesn't matter because that you know that thing worked whereas i've made films for other reasons or for other things or i haven't listened to myself and they're the films i've been most disappointed with so i think um yeah i think you walk out with you know the purpose you know you feel like there's a purpose for this story that you're mm. sharing. Yeah. And and if it's personal to you, right, it's kind of like when people say, you know, I was attacked, I was raped, I mm. was this, I was an alcoholic, whatever it is, people listen mm. and they connect, they connect with you. And I think when people walk out of a theater right after watching a great film what they end up with is that thing that tosses around mm. for days that's the goal and months, i think yeah right in yeah. their head yeah that's the goal is that you you know for me anyway i mean i think for people to leave the cinema and i think of my favorite filmmaking experience like film watching experiences and i'm still thinking about that film for days you know films like um i don't know if you saw portrait of a lady on fire it's this amazing french Mm. film um you know and it's such a quiet film but you walk out of it and you're like oh my god (laughs) you know there's so much to think about um so yeah i mean even blue moon you know the the iphone film that steph harris made um Oh, yeah. Well, I know all about that film. Yeah. I I mean, I love that film and it was very inspiring for me. Like that to – I'd already shot One Punch when that film came out but I was like, wow, this is cool. Someone else is, you know, really going for it. And the story – but see, the story in Blue Moon is about two boys growing up and and having a different relationship, you know, to me anyway. That was what resonated in that story and and I didn't see it coming. And when it hit, it was, you know, it was very meaningful for me and – I'm sure Steph would feel like there's things that he would have rather done differently. Um, but to me, I think it's a, it's a, a great little, it's a classic little film, you know. It's a, it's a really special film. So, um, Well, I'm going to ask you and I'm going to ask our listeners, if they haven't already, listen to episode 54, I believe mm. is the one with Steph Harris. Cool. Um, and then go to 55. Mm. Uh, with uh, Jed Brophy and then mm. just continue to work your way up <laughs> because uh, I've I've had just about everybody, including um, Judd Resnick, yeah. um, the editor on, right. on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, it's a very special film for me um, as well because um, it, it was just, it was one of those inspiring films. I think... Mm that their their openness to discuss it, you know what mm. I'm saying, uh, was really crucial to inspiring a lot of people, almost in the same way that Tangerine mm. did, mm. Uh, you know, for you initially. Mm. But yeah. yeah, it's the story. It's yeah. the, 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 the connection between the characters and the story and the way that, um, of course, you know, 
I'm not going to compare Jed Brophy and Mark Hadlow to the actors in your film, uh, you know, but different, different I am going to say yeah. that that connection has to be there. Yeah. I, I think when you, you know, what Steph does well in that film is that he, and Tangerine does well as well, is that it doesn't tell you, you may think it's about one thing, but during through the course of watching it becomes about something else. And I think that ability, and that's where the difference comes in is, yes, you're telling your own story. Yes, this story has been told before, but it's what's unique about you as a filmmaker that makes the story unique. And it's if you can find that unique way of telling it, um, which I think Steph really did. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah, that's my advice. And, and, and what I really liked about yours too is that it does have a message to it. Mm. It's, it's not a message that has a pretty ending. No. You know, but it does do that one thing, which is what we're really talking about, which is it makes you stop and think. Yeah. And keep thinking and trying to solve a problem, mm. which in real life, right, mm. doesn't have a clear solution. Not yet, no, no. No, but it opens up the dialogue and the yeah. thought process for that. And that's uh, that's uh, that's something that we, we, one of the reasons why I think filmmaking is so powerful as far as, you know, sharing stories, mm. because it does something that just getting up somewhere and talking and or writing yeah. doesn't do and it can really grab at people from where it counts from the heart it's it's interesting see there, there's a, you asked me for advice i guess the only other thing i'd say is do your research because um mm. when i went to make this film i spoke to a lot of people like i spoke to the police i spoke to people who worked in trauma who had dealt with the aftermath of the you know, one punch attacks um because the actual issue is not the person being hit in the head. It's not the punch to the face. It's when the person falls and hits the ground. That's the issue. Um, and because they often get knocked out and then they, they hit the ground. But I spoke to this amazing woman whose son had been a victim of one of these um, incidents. And she gave me her time. And, and actually a line in the film comes from her where she says, you know, if it had been my boy that had gone out and hit someone that night, I would still be standing behind him, you know. It's not, oh. it's not these boys that are doing it. It's how they, you know, it's, it's how they get to that stage where they think this is appropriate. Um, and that, and that was an amazing, you know, thing. And you only get that from, from talking to people and actually trying to go as deep as you can. So do your full research, which is something usually people do when they're, you know, create, you know, making documentaries, yeah, but you should yeah. also do it for your film yeah well i mean actors do it a lot i mean i think as filmmakers mm -hmm. you've got to you've got to know as much about the world as possible yeah yeah uh a film that i worked on uh, the girl was playing somebody blind and she spent a week with a with a blind person yeah you know um so wow this has been a, a really great conversation is there anything that i have no for, first of all how can people for someone who's driving and listening to this, mm. um, what's one quick way to find you on social media? Like, are you uh, mo <laughs> mostly on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram? Where are you? Uh, that's a really, I'm a little bit pre uh, social media. Um, but if you want to, you can find me on Instagram. But my handle is Danger Das. Um, so D A N G E R D A R C E, um, or you can. Uh, my company is called Rooftop Film Co. So you can find me through there. But mainly, I, I mainly just post random pictures on Instagram, um, things I find beautiful in the day, and then, um, and then you know, family, kids, dogs, those kinds of things. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, we all love our dogs. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and also how open are you if someone wants to you know is making a feature film as long as you have a few minutes oh right? yeah get in touch that's no problem um you know like i said i, I spoke to steph I, I i got in touch with steph and he gave me some advice at one stage which he didn't have to do but he was so generous um so i think that's how it works you know you pass it on yeah very good yeah. i love it well say goodbye to our listeners unless you've got something else you think we, no, it's we missed. All good. I'll catch you later, everyone. Thank you for listening. And, and I can't wait to listen to more of these, Susie. They're really inspiring. Thank you.